want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Wow, this is quite a crowd that have come to hear about daguerreotypes. This is really exciting. Um, my name is Jane Aspinwall. I'm the Associate Curator of Photography here at the Nelson. Um, I want to start off by thanking the Photography Society, whose generous support uh, provided for that we could have this lecture. I also need to say from Natalie that if any of you are interested in receiving our emails, um, we give updates about what's going on in the department. We also uh, send out a quarterly newsletter that is really a superb piece of literature. Um, and if you're interested, the <laughs> we have clipboards in the back where you can leave your email. Well, let me start by saying that here at the Nelson Atkins, we are huge fans of the work of Jerry Spagnoli. Keith first started acquiring his work for the Hallmark Photographic Collection in 2001, and the Nelson has continued to acquire work for most of his ongoing series. For me, Spagnoli's work is a culmination of what the potential of Daguerrean art can be. Certainly not a dead art, not one overshadowed by the process, but one full of creativity and true artistry. One of the most eloquent and insightful speakers on the Daguerrean art of his own Daguerrean work, Spagnoli commented, the image is not in a steady state like other photographs. It is elusive, fugitive. It remains a potential image until it is presented under the correct optical spatial conditions. And the light from a scene in the past strikes your eye like new. End quote. But in the end, these images must speak for themselves, and so they do, powerfully and beautifully. A photographer since the mid-1970s, Spagnoli received his art education from the San Francisco Art Institute. Initiating his exploration of the daguerreotype in San Francisco in 1994, he experimented with 19th century materials and studied the effects achieved by early practitioners in order to understand the technical aspects of the process, as well as its, its expressive and visual potential as a medium. In 1995, he began an ongoing series titled The Last Great Daguerrean Survey of the 20th Century and continued this project after his move to New York City in 1998, where he currently lives and works. In this series, Spagnoli features views of the city and images of significant happenings, including the destruction of the World Trade Center on 9-11, the vigil following the disappearance of JFK Jr., and Times Square at midnight on the eve of the new millennium. Considered the leading expert in the revitalization of the daguerreotype process, Spagnoli is also noted for his collaboration with the artist Chuck Close on daguerreotype portraits. Spagnoli's interest in the characteristic qualities of the photographic process extends to other aspects of his work. In his photomicrograph series, he explores how people, photographed at great distances and then enlarged many times, are readable as human forms from the most minimal information. In Pantheon, a series of color photographs, Spagnoli placed a radiating sun at the center of each image, the effect of which is enhanced by his use of a pinhole camera. This project morphed into the series Local Stories, in which Spagnoli used a wide-angle lens instead of a pinhole camera, but continued to keep the sun as the central motif. In his Glasses series, one of which we currently have hanging in our gallery, Spagnoli produces an increasingly larger 11 by 14 inch daguerreotype of glasses carefully stacked upon a mirror, producing a beautiful interplay between light and form. 11 by 14 daguerreotype. That is really huge. <laughs> Jerry says that he can produce an even larger daguerreotype, but we're still waiting. <laughs> Jerry. Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. His work has been featured in many museum exhibitions, including several here at the Nelson Atkins. His work is held by major museums like the Museum of Modern Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Getty, the Museum of the City of New York, the Whitney, the Museum of Fine Art Boston, the National Portrait Gallery, the Fogg Museum, the Chrysler Museum, and the High Museum. Additionally, Spagnoli regularly gives workshops teaching the daguerreotype process to willing students throughout the country. 
It gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Jerry Spagnoli. Fuss for a second here with my uh, my thing. Oh my God! I wonder how I do this. I've discovered. You, if you'll indulge me, um, I'm going to have to get out. I've discovered. I should have practiced this. <laughs> you think, you know? Um, where's the record button? Hmm. File. Go down. Oh yeah, there it is. Thank you. I'm so well organized. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the daguerreotypes, and uh, I sort of I, 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 well, my plan is to make some observations um, and to sort of not necessarily illustrate them so much as uh, keep you visually amused while I'm making the observation with daguerreotypes. And actually, at some point, at a certain point, I'm going to show some of my own uh, work that's not daguerreotypey, but I think. Um, let's say, is inspired by what I've learned by operating in, with daguerreotypes. So um, the first thing I want to do is, is uh, say something about this institution. And I know that sometimes people take for granted, you know, what's easily accessible. And, you know, coming in from out of town, I'm always impressed by the collection of this museum and the way it's presented and the quality of the curatorial intelligence in all of the departments here. So I just want to say that, you know, you should really appreciate what you've got here. And additionally, I'd like to make a point that uh, this institution has what I feel and I don't feel any, I don't think it can be challenged, has the greatest collection of daguerreotypes in the world. And I've seen other collections. I've been to the Bibliothèque Nationale and the Getty and all these other places. And the collection here is the one that's outstanding. Um, so. I think that you should know that and you should definitely take advantage of opportunities to see these things. They're amazing. Um, all right, so um, one of the reasons I was invited actually to speak here um, is that I've made observations about daguerreotypes that I think might be useful. Um, and in particular, I'm not even showing you an image yet because I don't exactly know what to present when I make this argument. Maybe I'll just show some things. All right, well, actually, we'll start with something um, that's, again, an observation. Um, when we see daguerreotypes, I think a lot of times we look at them f with 21st century eyes, and we see them as antique images, and they're interesting, and you know, they, you know, they're charming. But I think we fail to realize what happened or what must have happened in the culture when they were introduced. And it's worth thinking about the precedents that were available before the daguerreotype was introduced. These uh, several paintings are American from about 1840s. And this is what the average person would have seen as a painting for the most part. All of the great paintings were in Europe and basically rumors. Uh, you had etchings coming through. But unless you lived in one of the great cities like uh, Boston or New York, your exposure to painting would be very limited and you would have this folk art painting as representative. And this is what also was available to you if you wanted to record a loved one. Um, and now, I think these are very charming paintings, but they're, let's say, separated from life. They're not um, real representations of your experience of the person who you love uh, sufficiently to want to have uh, recorded. Then the daguerreotype happened and suddenly you had um, a document which captured all of the vitality of your loved one in what boiled down to an instant. Um, this is uh, a prodigy. Uh, the, the child must have just always had a smile on her face because it's <laughs> This has to have been a six-second exposure, at the least. So it wasn't, it wasn't spontaneous, but it, it looks it, and it is that child. And this is the, the, one of the great charms of the daguerreotype, 
is its ability to present the world the way it looks. There's a transparency here. This, this woman here actually has a daguerreotype in her hands. And my own notion, and I don't, I don't think I'm wrong about this, daguerreotypes were used as a, a method of communication in the day. And one of the reasons that daguerreotypes have the power they do as portraits, it wasn't so much that the uh, daguerreotypists were great, uh, let's say, portrait photographers, although they were. The power that they were tapping into was that the person sitting was trying to communicate with somebody somewhere else. So, for example, in this daguerreotype, I don't think it's a stretch to say that she made this daguerreotype to return an image to the person who sent her the daguerreotype in her hand. So when she looks into the lens of the camera, she's actually thinking about the person who's going to receive this image. Now, we get the image years later, more than a century later, and we sort of receive that look, you know, the look of intimacy and emotion that she intended for a private person. And this is the, the power of many daguerreotypes, rests in that communication, that sense of visual communication. And this is an intuition that the sitters had. You, you couldn't hire a painter to paint a painting of you that could have that intensity. But the daguerreotype did it automatically because of what it was, how it, how it operated as a photographic me media. Now, the um, aspect of the daguerreotype, I think, also which makes it uh, unique in photo history, and I think particularly powerful, is the substrate. Now you'll notice when you go over and um, look at the show, which of course everybody, I presume, has either seen or is going to see, um, you'll see that they're in a dark chamber and that they're lit with spotlights. And this, of course, is exactly the perfect way to, to show a daguerreotype, because the daguerreotype is an optical medium. And it's the only optical medium in the whole form of photography. Um, and what I mean by that is a camera operates by transmitting light through a lens. And then that lens projects an image which has to be received by some medium, some photosensitive medium. A piece of film or a Polaroid is intended to produce an image on a piece of paper or a flat, non-reflective surface. The medium of the daguerreotype receives the, protect, the projected image on a piece of polished silver. And a piece of polished silver is basically a front surface mirror. And if anybody knows anything about optical engineering, you know that within any optical bench, a front surface mirror is a component of the optical system. It's not. Um, a medium which is intended, well, one of the problems with, with daguerreotypes in the early days, it's not intended for reproduction, it's not intended for um, being translated into some other medium. It is what it is. So the way that the front surface mirror operates is that, um, <clears throat> I've lost uh, that particular thread, but Imagine, I will have to, reconform, I have to reconfigure my argument because I realize that it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. My, the way that the daguerreotype works is it's a front surface mirror with particles of silver dispersed across it and those particles of silver represent the image. Now, there's a quality that daguerreotypes have which has been referred to um, casually as holographic and what that refers to is the sense of space. Even in reproduction, when you look at this image here, even though it's, it's reproduced um, and it's from a slide and probably scanned and then put into a computer and then projected here, you still have a, an odd sense of volume. And this is part of the, the, the capable capabilities of the, the photographers who were operating in that period. This, by the way, is uh, Whipple. Uh, who is one of the great Boston daguerreotypists. So this is a self-portrait of Whipple. So clearly a master daguerreotypist made this of himself. But getting back to the, uh, the issue of how the, uh, how the image operates within the daguerreotype system, it has a sense of volume because of the front surface mirror combined 
with the particles of silver on the surface. And I came to this uh, realization, I would always make these presentations and I would ask, well, why is it that daguerreotypes look like they have space in them? And a uh, optical engineer was kind enough to come up to me after one of the shows and he delivered the statement that, well, it's because there's a virtual image and there's an image. And then he walked away. And <laughs> I had absolutely no idea what that meant, but I did, it did give me something to work with. And what it meant was that an image reflected in a mirror is a virtual image. It's an image which doesn't actually, for example, exist on the surface of the mirror. The image in a mirror appears to be as far behind the surface of the mirror as whatever is being reflected in it is in front of the mirror. So there's an inherent sense of space. This is why when people want to make rooms look bigger, they put mirrors in them, uh, because it makes it look like there's more space. So combine that with the fact that there's an image on the surface of the mirror, and what you have is um, a subtle but convincing uh, illusion of depth. When you look at a daguerreotype, you have to reflect a dark field in it, generally. Um, and when you do that, that reflection is not really easily discernible because you're concentrating on the uh, surface of the mirror, which is where the image itself is, but you subliminally pick up the sense that there's space behind the image that you're seeing. And that's kind of the magic or the miracle of the daguerreotype. When Daguerre invented the daguerreotype, um, there was a lot of talk about, oh, you know, it was just an accident, or, you know, he didn't really know exactly what he was doing, and it just happened. And, but I don't believe that's actually true. Daguerre, as probably a lot of you know, and if you don't know, had a uh, theatrical presentation called a diorama, which basically showed enormous paintings which were modified uh, through varying light and uh, using uh, candles and torches and skylights combined with front projected light, combined with mirrors. So he was using mirrors for their optical illusionary qualities. In fact, there are reports that he painted the surfaces of mirrors in order to create some of his effects. So he would have looked at mirrors, he would have seen that there were paintings on them. Again, sort of a proto daguerreotypian presentation. So I'm sure that when it came to his you know, mind to create photography, or perhaps while he was working on it, he realized that it was necessary to maintain the image on the metal plate. There was actually a letter written to Niepce where he complained about Niepce's desire, to, and Niepce, by the way, was his partner early on in the invention of photography. Niepce, he was complaining to Niepce about the fact that Niepce wanted to make prints, that he was interested, and basically Niepce and his process invented photomechanical reproduction, which I think is a tremendous invention that you know, is overlooked, I think. Um, but Daguerre had in his mind the notion that the image should be on a metal plate. And I think that what he was after was this illusion of depth. If you look at Daguerre's work, by the way, I'm doing a presentation um, on Saturday, and I'm not showing, I could obviously illustrate this with all of these things I'm talking about, I will do that on Saturday. I hope all of you can come to that. But in Daguerre's own work, the illusion of space and the sense of light were critical elements to the presentation. In fact, they were the fundamental content of the work. Uh, I think that that was, uh, he was obviously um, a man of light, you know, when it came to being a painter. The subject um, was not the subject. The subject was contained in the metaphor of light and space. And I think that the daguerreotype is inherently um, suited to that. Hopefully, now when I show you know, my own work at a certain point, um, you're gonna notice how that works and I'll present arguments for it. But getting back to the casual vernacular, these images are completely unprecedented. When you think about, even as photography progressed and paper photography superseded the daguerreotype, there actually was a diminishment in the power of photography. Um, photography lost the, um, let's say, the um, simulacral aspect that it has 
as an image in your hand. When you look at a daguerreotype, if you suspend your disbelief, you can convince yourself quite easily that you're actually looking at a person suspended in time. Um, paper media, you don't get that. You get other things. You get graphic, graphic effects, but um, not this sense of uh, presence. And uh, immediacy is another word that people use. It's, it's an odd word to use, but, you know, there it is. Um, these kids exist now as they existed then. You know, they're just as alive now. Um, we sort of know these kids. It's so convincing. And I know that it's because of the medium itself. It's, then there's this, this kind of uh, an image, which some people have a, a notion that uh, daguerreotypes are basically uh, dour people sitting unsmiling um, and in some sort of distress. And that's the full extent of the Daguerrean art. Um, and short of that, I mean, there was actually uh, John Sarkowski, a very intelligent man, um, once remarked that uh, he just dismissed daguerreotypes as uh, you know, little images difficult to see. And, and I have tremendous respect for him, but I disagree with that particular point. This is a whole plate daguerreotype, which is quite a large daguerreotype, six and a half by eight and a half inches. And um, I can't imagine a more spontaneous photograph until, let's say, the 1880s, 1890s, maybe. And, and then it would have been hamstrung by the conception of the moment, which was a kind of pictorialist uh, idea to try to make it look like an engraving or, or a painting of a genre scene. So here you have you know, the spontaneity of photography fully realized. And not only that, but completely free of all of the, uh, the, the conceits of uh, Western art. Um, this would have actually, well, here's an interesting point. The photographer who took this, what inspired him to take it, aside from the fact that he probably liked these kids and he knew them uh, and thought it would make a great image, he was probably after a genre scene. He was probably after something that would look like, you know, the classic kind of kid playing. But what he got instead, because you can't control the medium, you know, that way. You have to let the medium do what it does. What he got was a slice of life which has all the vitality um, of the moment presented now forever, basically. And there's nothing hackneyed about it. There's nothing predictable about it, you know. So this is the things that Daguerreotype made possible. Oh, sorry that daguerreotype made possible for artists in the moment. This is a great one. I remember actually, I, I, I remember the person who had this originally and he discovered this. You can see that, that ring around the woman. Well, that's where the original mat was on this image. And the guy, and, and th this collector noticed that, you know, crumpled piece of paper. And this is everybody, is every collector's dream, right? He's like, he noticed that crumpled piece of paper and he wondered, you know, well, what's that? And he took the mat off and there's this guy, <laughs> you know, and, it's, and this is like even, even how, you know, even when the photographer tried to thwart the, uh, the spontaneity of photography, you know, photography won in the end because he, you know, there it is, it's, it, it, was, it is the scene, it's not this controlled and contrived um, idea of what an image might be, it is simply an image. And that's the genius of the daguerreotype, what it turned loose. It made um, people who didn't know anything about what a photograph or what a painting or what a drawing should look like into artists by direct engagement that some guy who maybe used to be a dentist or maybe used to be a, a penmanship instructor decides to take up the craft of daguerreotypy. Um, in the period, in the 19th century, it was very common for uh, people to change professions every few years or every decade. Uh, the economy moved very rapidly and there were depressions that would occur. So a lot of people from disparate professions took up the daguerreotype. So what you end up with is you get a kit and it's a camera and it you know, has a ground glass and a lens. Uh, again, you know, I'll show all of this kind of material aspects of the medium on Saturday. But, so you have a ground glass and you have a lens and it projects this image onto the ground glass. So you're discovering visual, um, the organization of visual space through a camera without instruction except for what you can see through the camera. The camera is teaching you how to see. And that's the, that's the genius 
of what occurred in the Daguerrean era in America in particular. In Europe, unfortunately, you find not nearly as much spontaneity, although I recently saw uh, a collection that actually had uh, considerable spontaneity in it, but it's very exotic to find it in Europe because everyone who took up the daguerreotype, for the most part, um, knew enough about art history to be hamstrung by it. Um, and it's always a bad thing. This, like an image like this, I mean, it's just absolutely stunning and incredible. I mean, first of all, state of preservation is fantastic. But this is a daguerreotypist studio. And, you know, this guy just got this idea, you know, maybe he's, again, maybe he's sending this to a relative, you know, in another town, you know, or, or maybe he's waiting for his wife to arrive. And it's, he thought this would be a really charming you know, kind of expression of his waiting for her. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are possible, you know, but the image itself is brilliant. Uh, it, it, it gives you a peek into um, the lived moment in this very specific spot, in this very specific time. There's nothing else that, that, that would even conceive of this uh, in that period or for decades afterwards, so, you know. I mean, you could think of a hundred different stories for this, you know, so, I mean, if you think of this as communication to somebody else, I mean, God only knows, you know, so. And this, again, you know, this, is, this was clearly, you know, the guy who did this had seen genre hunting scenes, you know, maybe a painting or you know, an etching where, and he just set this up, but still, you know, there's that dog, and that's like a real dog, and, and it, it just elevates the image above any of the contrivance that might have been intended. This is kind of an, an interesting shot for me because it has this kind of, you know, let's say postmodernist aspect to it, because um, the fellow there, it might be a little hard to see, is uh, painting a backdrop. So this is a daguerreotype of him, and he's painting this artificial backdrop, a Greek column nonetheless. And so you've got this kind of play on, you know, the simple reality of, you know, his droopy pants and his hat and his kind of like, you know, turned up collar and his rolled up sleeves. And then you have this kind of, let's say, moderately pretentious uh, backdrop, which some, you know, uh, some well-dressed gentleman would like to be photographed in front of. And, you know, and here he is kind of creating that. And then on, in turn, the daguerreotypist is creating this. Maybe in this particular case, th this uh, might have been the payment for that fellow who is doing the backdrop, for all we know. Or, you know, so there are stories associated. But again, it's again, communication. It's pretty clear, you know, the woman down here on the left, you know, is looking out. She's She's looking at somebody who they know is going to get this, the woman up there too. They're not looking at us really, they're looking at some close friend or relative. Uh, but when we get the daguerreotype now, we receive that look and we receive that, uh, that emotional charge. Um, again, you know, the daguerreotype, I mean, it just, it just has, it, it just has it. These guys, rogues, and there's even more roguish, these guys. And I'll have you know, these guys are actually Texas Rangers, so this is the law, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, these aren't ruffians, technically, you know. These, this is, these are the police. So. But there they are, you know. You know, if somebody drew them, it wouldn't look like that, you know. It wouldn't have that visceral reality. Um, so. And this, I think, personally, I've always thought that this is one of the greatest photographs ever made. Um, I don't know that there's a photographer alive right now that could do this. You know, and then you think about it being done with a daguerreotype, with all the constraints that the medium imposed. And again, the, daguerre the daguerreotypist was lucky. You know, this happened. Uh, this is an unknown maker. It doesn't look like anybody that I would think stylistically you'd say, well, that's Samuel Root, that's Gurney, that's Easterly, or anybody. You know, this was probably some you know, just a regular guy making daguerreotypes somewhere. And in that moment, it all just fell together flawlessly. And the reason it did is because of his ability to look through the camera and see something and say, that's great, and capture it. So, again, it's a daguerrean 
quality. Um, and I, you have to answer, I, you know, you all know it, but it's like this was the first photographic medium that was available to the public. This is how photography started. And you can understand, you know, a master like Easterly refusing to uh, actually have anything to do with any other medium, even as, you know, amber types and prints and all of these other things came through. They were more profitable, people wanted them, but he refused because they, were, they, they could not compare to what he saw as the perfection of the daguerreotype. I don't think there's any other medium that arrived um, at its initial state perfect. There was no room for improvement, except maybe after shutter speed. But it was fully realized. The, the, the ambition of all of the people who were after photography, who were chasing photography, and this gets to the point that refers back to that optical quality. The desire to produce a photograph was inspired by people's um, engagement with the camera obscura. So when they would look through a camera obscura, in fact, you know, there are illustrations of people just gazing into camera obscura. Camera obscura is what we think of as a, a view camera, um, but it wasn't designed, it was pre-photographic. So you had a ground glass, you had a lens, and you could you know, look at the world on this screen. And people would just take the camera out and go out and look at trees and landscapes or people and be charmed by the way the light played on the ground glass. And that's what really, I think, drove the invention of photography early on, was an attempt to capture that. Well, what they were trying to capture was the optical quality that they were seeing. They weren't trying to capture a print, really, ultimately, I don't think, if you read what they were talking about. They were trying to capture that sparkle, you know, that, uh, that uh, sense of space. Um, and that's, I think, again, the daguerreotype fully realized that ambition. So I'm going to show a couple of, I, I, I never show portraits that I've shot generally. Sometimes I do, but, but not often. So I just thought, you know, since I show you a series of portraits, I just kind of go through these from earlier portraits. These are small plates, six plates that I, when I was starting out, I was working with. Um, that's a quarter plate. Um, some of these people are notable. Um, that's Eko Hosoi, the photographer. Uh, that's Lyle Rexer. This was, this was a couple that I photographed, I daguerreotyped over the course of a number of years. They would come like every year or two um, to um, have their image made. A lot of times it was a nude, the pet, two of them nude, and not in any weird way, just kind of like they just liked daguerreotypes. Um, but I remember I made, when I made this one here, you know, they said that they, you know, it was, they couldn't take it, you know, they didn't want it because it was, it was too strong, you know. I thought that was interesting, so I kept it, so it's mine now. So that's a conceptual artist, Bill Anastasi. He had this thing where um, he's a highly controlled kind of conceptual artist and uh, coming from the old school. And um, so he would pose, and I actually did some, some stuff for him, you know, for his kind of uh, his body of work. So I wanted him to pose for me. And he told me that, he goes, wait, you know, I have to think of something very specific. He had a very specific thing that he had to think of when I made his portrait. And I said, well, what is it? He says, I can't tell you. <laughs> and I knew better than to insist, you know. But so he had this thing worked out. And it's like every time he was photographed, he had to think of a very specific thing. So what it is, I guess it's up to you to decide. So. This came from a series of anatomical uh, studies that I worked on where um, I was kind of, I was imagining, because you know, photography f basically has its roots in the Renaissance. Um, actually, I guess to some degree you could say it has its roots in ancient Greece when they made those sculptures that were incredibly realistic. But I think in the Renaissance, you know, the, they were using optical devices to enhance the reality and the sense of space. Uh, in paintings, um, they would, uh, you know, um, sketch uh, studies to uh, improve their ability to produce uh, accurate foreshortening of limbs and the like. Uh, so I started thinking, well, you know, what if these guys had the daguerreotype, you know, to do their studies? So it was just a, it was a little conceit and it was necessary for me to kind of like generate momentum in the, in the series. Um, but this one here is uh, from Caravaggio. Uh, uh, there's a, 
there's a, a famous scene, I guess it's the Last Supper at Esau or whatever, where um, there's somebody sitting at the end of the table and they throw their hands out like that, like Jesus just told them that you know, he was going to kill and he was going to be killed and stuff. So, at any rate, whatever that's worth. Uh, it's Graham Nash. This is part of that anatomical study. That's Dan Esterbrook. That's David Crosby. This was an odd one. This is a family photo that I was uh, commissioned to make. And um, sometimes it happens. Uh, you know, the daguerreotype is an, is an interesting medium to work with. Uh, maybe it has to do with the way I work with it. But it, it's not always, uh, let's say, uh, obedient. So. Um, Occasionally, things get loose, and what happened with this one here was um, the uh, plate fell out of the plate holder in the middle of the shot, so it was just an awful sound. You have a sitter sitting there, and then it's just this thunk, and, <laughs> and then you have to pick up the whole camera and take the whole camera into what is a very tiny dark room and kind of fuss with it to try to get the thing out. But in the end, I, really, I thought it was really interesting, and especially if you knew the family and stuff, it was kind of like... You know, sometimes the accident informs the image in ways that are, you know, uh, metaphorically charged. Uh, so, these are mostly whole plates now. So this is actually 11 by 14. That's Adam Foos. That's a pair of whole plates. So, well, this 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 box here I made. Um, a number of years ago, I mean, I think uh, 95 or 96. And um, it came about because I was talking to this sculptor and he was talking about, you know, transience and uh, process art and uh, the ephemeral. And I was thinking about, well, you know, what would I do with a theme like that? And uh, the first piece I made was actually a box similar to this. Um, and it had a peephole in it. And what I did was I photographed a rose, and then I put that into the chamber above with a peephole and a ground glass on top. And then I put the image of the rose into the drawer so that this became this kind of reliquary. So as the rose would decay, you know, you could watch it decay, and it'll decay forever. And, but meanwhile, the image of the rose will be this kind of peak moment, and it's preserved perfectly. And I thought, you know, with daguerreotypes, that really is the nature of the daguerreotype, one of the natures, one of the many natures of the daguerreotype, that when you look at a daguerreotype, again, getting back to that sense of immediacy and that sense of presence that it, that it uh, transmits, you're always taken aback because it seems so live in, in your hand, but you know that person is 150 years gone. And this was a play on that, or that was a play on that. This, though, was an attempt to say, well, what's even more um, instantaneous or more elusive? So what I did with this series, I did a whole kind of half, well, I, what I did with this series is I took a, I made the box and at the top, I took a daguerreotype plate, a quarter plate, and I put a firecracker on top of the plate. And then I put a piece of anodized aluminum across it, clamped it down, and, sh and set the firecracker off. And um, I got a photogram of that explosion. Then I put the uh, daguerreotype inside of the drawer and kept the explosion form in the top. And like I say, I made like a half a pack of firecrackers, and I had this, I had this vision, I still have this vision someday of doing a gross of firecrackers. There'd be like 144 firecrackers. And actually, well, you know, because when I was a kid, you know, I remember there was nothing greater to the, a greater charge to the imagination around July 4th than thinking about a gross of firecrackers. You know? it's, like, it's like everybody wanted to have a gross of firecrackers. So, but what, what, what I found, it was particularly interesting about this. this. This one here I use because it really gives that sense of the release of energy. But quite a lot of these end up looking very much like, uh, like celestial photography. It looks like nebula and, and the like. And I think there's, you know, there's a wonderful little kind of metaphor there that you know, there's like the little bangs and big bangs and it's really kind of the same thing. It's just a matter of where you stand, right? So 
And that, so that relates to history. <laughs> so um, so th in this image here, you have what every photo editor would wish their photographers would bring back from a great event. You know, it's like perfectly formed. You know, everything is there. You know, of course, it didn't look like this at all. You know, it had not even remotely like this. Um, but this is, you know, our memory of it, and it's it's the structured thing. It's 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 the metaphor. Now, this image here, this is what photography does. I'm departing a bit from daguerreotypy, but I think now I'm going to make some points about I think photography, and in particular 19th century photography, and what and what what I think is sort of the, um, the existential position of 19th century photography. This is a photograph of Lincoln delivering the Gettysburg Address. So there, could, there can't be any more important moment in the history of America than this moment. But, and this is the photograph of it. And this is really what it was like to be there. And I think that's fantastic. I think that there's something so powerful about it and I think there's a, you know, there's a close up in here. And I have to go down to the Library of Congress and actually take a look at the real print really closely so I can find out where he is. There's a guy back there with a top hat, but I, I've heard um, that uh, he definitely wasn't wearing his hat when he read. That in fact, I think he took off his hat and took the, uh, the Gettysburg dress out of his hat and read it bareheaded. So he's probably in there actually. And while it's up here, I'm gonna go take a look at it. Because you know, I don't get an opportunity But he's probably in here in this scrum. This guy's killing himself. But anyway, like I say, they you know they they talk about you know the history is written by the victors and you know how to be suspicious of the the narratives that are delivered to you. And I think photography, particularly the kind of photography that was um, available in the 19th century, is the thing that cuts through or potentially can cut through. Now, of course, it's all being manipulated by the photo editors who have thousands and thousands of photos to choose from. And they have this kind of conceit that, you know, well, we're not manip manipulating the image, and God forbid, you know, somebody, some photographer should, like, do a little dodging and burning, because, ah, it's a lie, you'll never work again in this town. But the fact is, you're choosing from thousands and thousands of images. That's not manipulation? I mean, good God. So, <laughs> so anyway, so... Um, these sorts of images are really what life is about, you know? I mean, these are great events, but they're intimate because the presence of the photographer as an individual within this scene is so strong. It isn't um, kind of a hovering super being producing the image that perfectly epitomizes the narrative desired by whoever's purposes it suits. This really is some guy who tried to get himself into the best possible spot to make the best possible image. And a lot of times, you know, you have distinct limitations about what's available. This actually is how it was reproduced. I think it's tremendous respect. You know, they didn't alter it very much. You know, there are some conveniences made for, you know, the sake of, of, of let's say, uh, narrative form, but it's, it's pretty good. I mean, I, you know, they showed, they showed a lot of uh, class, I think. But this was, of course, during the period when the authenticity of the daguerreotype was um, an important uh, notion. Actually, complete aside, the daguerreotype has this reputation for the truth and for, you know, a sort of unembellished um, representation. And uh, one time, I remember, I was in a library, I was in San Francisco, and I was killing time. I was waiting for somebody to get a book. And I was going through the card catalog. And I thought, well, I'll look up daguerreotype. So I look up daguerreotype. And there's like, you know, a stack of cards, all baseball daguerreotypes. And I thought, well, I've never seen a baseball daguerreotype. How is it possible that I've never seen it? And there's, there appear to be 50, 60 books of baseball daguerreotypes. Well, it turns out that in the 1920s, when they would publish books of the historical box scores and batting records of baseball players, they would call them daguerreotypes. Now, I don't understand exactly why, but I think it's incredible that the daguerreotype in the 1920s still had that potency that there was, it was irrefutable and unobstructed fact that when you presented the raw numbers of a baseball player's career, 
you would refer to them as daguerreotypes because they were unimpeachable facts. So, at any rate, I think that's a fantastic tribute that after all those years, a daguerreotype ended up really meaning that. So, these are some news uh, photographs. This is uh, the Oswego Mill fire by Barnard. Um, this is an interesting image. It's uh, hand painted, hand colored, um, and it's, uh, I think, it can be said with confidence that it's from a whole plate daguerreotype which no longer exists. So this image was a copy of a larger daguerreotype. This is a sixth plate. And then it was presumably made available either for purchase or distribution to news organizations. And so this would have been, I believe, in the 1850s. Um, by the way, if anybody knows more than I do about any of these images, please speak up. I have, I'm not embarrassed about things like that. Um, this is another, this is a, a larger plate of the aftermath of that fire. This is a daguerreotype of uh, Avery Stranded, which was an incident that occurred uh, in a, near Niagara Falls, or actually in the rapids above Niagara Falls, where uh, some poor fellow fell into the stream, managed to get himself up onto a, uh, a piece of uh, stray wood, um, and he was trapped out there for a considerable period of time. Crowds came daguerreotypists came. <laughs> um, and this too became a widely distributed uh, image. I'm not sure exactly how many copies of this exist, but there's certainly more than a dozen as far as I know. Um, matter of fact, uh, uh, the Nelson Atkins, I believe, has one, uh, and a very good one. Um, so, and, and, and actually, you know, was, um, there was, I, I should actually have the direct quote, but there was like a snide reference in the journals of the day that, you know, it was very unfortunate for, for Mr. Avery who did not survive. Uh, but it seemed to have been good business for the daguerreotypists who showed up, so. Um, this is uh, Portsmouth Square in San Francisco. Something is going on. Again, this is, you'll see in my own work, you know, how, uh, and in, in an uncontrived way, I assure you, um, I end up with similar results, that you have no idea what's going on. Um, and that you could investigate it. I've heard reports that people have tried to go in with um, microscopes and try to read pieces of paper on the ground in an attempt to find out definitively what's going on. But there are clues, you know, you can see there's a, a tent over there that, you know, something is, has, that's the epicenter of, the, of whatever it is that's going on. There's an, there are American flags, man, I don't, it might have been 4th of July, it might have been election day. This is a great daguerreotype. Um, this is uh, a, a tribute. Now, I'm definitely gonna screw this up because I, I, did, I should have researched this. I, knew, I used to know exactly what this was about. There was um, a murder which occurred in San Francisco where the editor of an important newspaper was assassinated and a vigilante group was formed in order to uh, avenge him. Um, at least that's as far as I know. You probably, is that, is that okay? Um, so they have experts here, so I'm, I'm under a lot of pressure. Um, but this is a great image. Again, you know, it's like the moment in San Francisco, you know, these are the guys, you know, these are the vigilantes or simpatico uh, individuals, and you know, they're having themselves photographed. By the way, you'll see in my plates that the daguerreotype reverses the image. So when this was made, it was specifically made with either a prism on the front of the lens or a mirror in front of the lens to make sure that you could read that sign correctly. Uh, or, again, this might have been a copy of another plate which would then reverse it back to the way it was supposed to be and uh, that may have been made for distribution. There's only one uh, in existence that I know of. Actually, there's two. There's two in existence, but they're different images, so they're not the same copy. Uh, but there might have been more. Uh, but anyway, again, a news a news uh, story that um, and this this I used to use this one kind of exclusively when I wanted to lead into my stuff because I think it's it's so fantastic. This is you know San Francisco, and, and this kind of captures a certain aspect of the daguerreotype. Again, you know that sense of of light in a daguerreotype plate has a, a presence that suggests the immediate moment. Uh, because, and this is a little, all right, this is a little spacey, so I'm not sure everybody's gonna go with me on this, but the way that the daguerreotype works, it's not like a print where you have ink and paper. Um, the way the daguerreotype works is the image is really generated by light hitting it. It's sort of like this. 
if you had a record, okay, a, you know, old LP for the people who know what those are. Um, <laughs> if you had an LP, you can look at that LP and you know there's music on it, but you can't hear the music. You know, there, there, it's just you know it's there, it's in there. You only hear the music when you apply an instrument to it, like a record player and a needle. Um, the daguerreotype is like that too, I think, that it doesn't really exist until you've applied light to it. And because of that, the image itself actually is recreated from moment to moment by the light that hits it when you're viewing it personally. And I think that there is something subliminal in that. I don't think it's, I mean, of course, it could be just because daguerreotypes and other kinds of arts, I guess, too, you know, they, they attract people who perhaps uh, spin these fantasies about them. But I think in a daguerreotype, there is something to it. When you see a beautiful daguerreotype and you, and you, and you appreciate the light of a scene like this, there's something compellingly real and, and true about it that puts you in the moment. Okay, so that's the daguerreotype, that's San Francisco, that's uh, 1850 probably. But then there's this figure over here on the right-hand side, which you, know, you don't pay too, too much attention to until you do pay attention to it, him, here. And it's like, well, who is that? And, and why is he wearing that hat? And is he even facing forward or backward? And so this is the thing, you know, you have the combination of this objective, thoroughly convincing representation of the real, and then you have a conundrum like this, where it's, why, how did it happen? He's obviously, posed it. I could make up stories, but I have no reason to believe that they're true. Uh, so, anyway. So, my own work, I st when I started making daguerreotypes, this, by the way, this is the inauguration of uh, Barack Obama, the first inauguration, and, um, when I started making daguerreotypes, I was thinking about, you know, well, what was, you know, what would I do with them? And um, it really seemed important to me, based on what I'd come, how I'd come to appreciate the medium, that I use them for um, a documentation. Um, and in particular, to whatever extent I could, a documentation which was very much about um, things that were happening on the street. So I've, I've you know, I'm, I have an inherent interest in those sorts of things. As a matter of fact, I have a book which was started, that I made before the, the daguerreotypes, that I, before I started working with daguerreotypes, which kind of led into um, that. And so anyway, the, the book unfortunately sold out here in the, the bookstore, so I won't, even, I won't even bring it up. So, <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, this, this was, um, let me see, I, should I, I, I can't tell the story. Uh, but it was a lot of trouble, a great deal of trouble. <laughs> To, uh, to get myself to this spot and to make this image. Um, and it was very cold. I think those are the pertinent, the pertinent <laughs> facts. So, um, this is a uh, ticker tape parade in New York City uh, in honoring the um, New York Yankees. Um, this is a Veterans Day uh, presentation. Uh, this is just people. This is a four second exposure. Uh, Bethesda Fountain in uh, Central Park. These are just some stray images of the moment. This is a, uh, a janitor's strike against a bank in uh, San Francisco. This is another ticker tape parade. Uh, had the good fortune of uh, the Yankees being very successful. Uh, <laughs> But here's a, here's a case where, you know, I just told you what it was, just like I told you what those other ones were, but you wouldn't really know it, although you might be curious enough to try to find out. At, at one point I was thinking about, and I did a few, where I took newspaper clippings and put them behind the plate. These were all, were all cased at the time. And, um, but then I sort of, I thought, well, you know, it's better that people don't really, like I'm, you know, like I'm telling you all this stuff here now, so you think, well, everyone's going to know that. But they won't, you know, because if you look at, if you look at the way that history works, it's the weirdest thing. There are all kinds of images, and there's all kinds of historical moments that we know practically nothing about, and you would think, well, that was a big deal. How come we don't know anything about that? It's because everybody forgets. You know, it's like no one cares enough to write it down, and then before you know it, it's gone, and then everyone's wondering, well, what is that? Why did he take that picture? Who is that? Anyway, so. 
And there are people who complain when you don't write things down. I've, I've had conservation people tell me that I should keep copious notes of everything that I do. But it's like, well, when would I have time to go out and shoot? Um, this was uh, the Amadou Diallo protest march in uh, New York City. But again, see, the thing about these, you know, I mean, they're, the, I, I tell you those because, I mean, they're the kind of thing that, you know, you came here, so I, I can tell you these things, and, it's, and you know, it's, I think it's good to know, but the images are different. The images, are, they're, they're really not about that event. They're about something more universal, and they're about also, as I was saying, being present in that particular space. This is the uh, JFK um, vigil, outside JFK Jr. vigil. Um, <coughs> In this particular case here, this is kind of an interesting little story because I think it gets to a point that I've been making all along, and that is that uh, it, a, a number of days had passed. I mean, I, 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 I am rather lazy despite apparent productivity. Um, and, and, you know, I have other things and I just kind of get distracted and I just wait for the kind of moment to inspire me to do something. So I thought I'd better go down there and make a document. So I went down there, and uh, there were all these people down there, and I'm trying to think, there's no shot. There is absolutely no way to organize this space into anything like a photograph. But, you know, I had two plates, and I was determined to use them. So there was a loading dock. Um, on the, you can see the sidewalk here. So there's a loading dock, and it was closed, but there was a ledge, and the ledge was probably about, you know, 18 inches or so. So I got up on top of that and I kind of set the camera up on the tripod. I work with a view camera. A, this was shot with a 5x7 view camera, so it's fairly, fairly large. And there's a ground glass behind it that you have to focus. And you could, I could barely get my head between the door and the, the ground glass. So I'm working on this. I'm kind of setting it up. And, you know, and at that time, there were all these guys with video cameras right there. So I get it all set up and uh, I got one shot off with the guys with video cameras. Um, and then something happens, and they all tear their cameras off the tripods and go running across the street. And it's like, shit, you know? It's like, <laughs> shot's gone, you know? It's like, I, I, after all that work, you know? And, uh, and I'm standing there, so I thought, oh, shit, I'll just shoot it. So I shot it, and uh, what's actually occurred, I found out that, that evening watching the news, is at that exact moment, a sergeant is over here. Over here. And that's where all the cameras are. And he's announcing that the body's been found. So this is the exact moment when they found the body and announced it to the press. So this is a photograph of that event. Now, obviously, this is not the photograph the newspapers would have chosen. And it's not the way it looked on the, on the nightly news. But this is a document of that moment. And for me, not just because I'm sentimental, but for me, it's, it's, it's realer than the cultivated image, which was you know, broadly uh, spread around the world. In fact, they probably all look the same. I have this notion, of course, they'll, they'll never admit it, but someday they won't even send photographers to an event. They'll just go to stock photographs and they'll find something that looks the way they want and they'll Photoshop it a little bit. <laughs> and that's the end of it. You know, save huge amounts of money. Corporations are going to like that and that'll be the end of like everyone's complaining about it because it's so, it's so much cheaper. So, except there'll be daguerreotypists, hopefully, who will continue to make absurd documents of these moments. These are just images of the moment. I like to think that any, any image you make is somehow a container of the historical moment. So sometimes, you know, events can be very small. And this gets to a, a later body of work, which I'm closing in on here. This, by the way, is the World Trade Center. So this was shot December the year before. This is uh, preparations for uh, New Year's Eve in Times Square. This is actually uh, New Year's Eve 2000. Uh, this is a story. Um, 
as you can imagine, it was hard to get into this situation. But I had, I can remember when I was young, um, like I was 12 maybe, and um, there was a thing, I, I, you, might, you might be aware from my name that I'm Italian, American, you know, and you know, my family came over, you know, on the boat, as they say. And, um, and of course, you know, there are all kinds of fanciful ideas that animate their, their, um, uh, fan their lives. Uh, one of these was, uh, my father was convinced, and, and a lot of people seem to be convinced, even Jean Dixon, if you remember who she was, uh, were convinced that the world was going to end in 2000. And so, you know, back in the day, you know, when I was 12, it was the 60s, you know, and it was like, you know, everyone was thinking the world was going to end soon. Um, so I thought, 2000, wow, that's incredible. So I did the math, you know, and it was like, holy shit, I'm gonna, I might be alive. <laughs> To see the end of the world. I mean, that is like so cool. So, um, so needless to say, you know, in 2000, I realized I had to be some. I had to be at the epicenter of where I didn't believe the world was going to end. I mean, by this time here, you know, obviously, but still, it had left an impression on me that, like, somehow or another, I needed to be there at 2000. So, I kind of finagled a, a press credential from from a magazine, and then I managed to get a a stand credential so I could get to the top of the stand. And it was like this huge aluminum structure in Times Square. This is before it became a big showbiz event. You know, the, it, it, this was, it was pretty raw. Um, it was just what it was. And if you remember, you know, everybody here probably remembers 2000, they had that thing where they went around the world and every time it crossed midnight, they would show it on TV and it would be a big thing. So Times Square was set up kind of to participate in that whole cycle. And so this, this thing, it was, let's say, 20 stories high. And um, I get there, and I have really no space. I just have a credential. I got, and there's all these uh, video crews from all over the world there. And you know, I don't know if any, if any worked around video crews that do the news or events. They're really hard guys. You know, like they, they are, they're going to get their shot. And if, it, if they have to kill you to get it. it <laughs> No problem, no problem, because they know the cops, they're friends with them, it's, it's, it's not an issue. So, but I was so kind of absurd with my camera, I was up there, so I, so I managed to find like two guys who were simpatico with the absurd idea that I was up there with a wooden view camera in 25 degree weather and I was six hours early, you know, and they said, all right, you know, you can stand right there, you know, and it was like exactly two feet of space. So I, so I set up, you know, and I'm kind of like, I was shooting this, that, the other thing, you know, just to try to keep myself, you know, alert. Um, you find when you stand in the cold for a long period of time that your brain doesn't work as well as it should. <laughs> it's, so it was, it, yeah, and you couldn't go to the bathroom because if I left, you know, they just tossed the camera. I knew it. You know, I just knew it. So I had to stand there, you know, basically legs spread with the camera and wait. So the whole night passes, you know get to the midnight, getting close to midnight, and um, I'm noticing that the, this, the stand is becoming fuller and fuller. I've got like the governor and the mayor there. I got all kinds of people like just basically elbowing their way into this situation. So two minutes before, I pull the dark slide. Um, I, fig I calculated a four minute exposure. So two minutes before I pull the dark slide, and it's like, all right, that's good. You know, everything's going, and then, and then there's the moment, bang, you know, it's like, you know, the, uh, well, what happened was, fireworks go off, balloons are released from everywhere in the square, and uh, confetti comes down from everywhere above, and the entire space is filled, I've never seen anything like it, um, the entire space, it looked like a bowl of ramen noodles. <laughs> it was absolutely extraordinary, but you could not see three feet in front of your face. And I'm making an exposure. And then, and then to make matters worse, there is two girls, two little girls sending me, maybe, let's say nine and 11. And they're jumping up and down, yelling, I can't believe it's happening. I can't believe it's happening. And the camera is on the piece of aluminum that they're jumping on. So the camera's going like this. And I'm thinking, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. So, all right. So, it goes on. So er, after the main kind of moment, I shot two more plates, fine, pack up, 
head back to the studio. I develop the plates, and you don't have to clear plates right away. You know, you can, you can develop them and hold them and then clear them later. So I just developed them all, went to sleep. Get up in the morning, and it's like, I've got all these plates I have to clear. It's like, all right. So I'm picking up the, uh, uh, the plate holders, and I'm going to put them away. And I feel one is like heavy, you know, so it's still got a plate in it. And I'm thinking, ah, just pull the dark slide and chuck it. But then I thought, no, you know, what the fuck, you know. I went through the trouble to shoot. So I develop it, and it was this plate. So, but here's the joke, here's the punchline. The plates that I shot after this using the four minute exposure completely overexposed and useless. And what happened was the exposure um, needed to be two minutes. So at the two minute mark, the fireworks go off, I get the fireworks, and then a scrim of orange balloons and confetti interferes with my exposure, completely masks the film, and the plate and keeps me from overexposing the film or the plate and there's the image. So now I don't know what to say about that. So I sort of I, that that I think in a nutshell is why I do photography because that kind of stuff happens and it's and it's like this tremendous affirmation, cosmic affirmation. That's it. That's that's like the reward for doing photography. So anyway. I make too much of it. This was a lucky shot. I mean, you can't plan this. Although, this was an odd situation. I was tracking this storm with a Doppler radar. I've been trying to get lightning for a considerable time, and I've actually tried since and never come anywhere near anything like this. I tracked this, uh, this storm on Doppler radar, and uh, I heard a crack at the north side of my building. My view is south. So I opened the lens, and um, I still have never seen any kind of exposure like this, I was shooting 2.8, and I calculated a nine minute exposure. I mean, and I've never come close to seeing it this dark, that dark, again. So I, that must have been a huge storm. At any rate, nine minutes, you know, I'm not gonna sit and stand there. So I go, you know, I'm doing what I need to do, and all of a sudden, crack, boom! And I didn't see it, you know, so I, it's like, I hope it's in the play, because, you know, my luck and is that it'd be like just outside the, or actually there's a daguerreotypist who tried to make you know a lightning shot and he spent like months in this very specific spot where the, you know they had more lightning than any place else in the world and he ended up with a plate where he actually had to kind of scallop the mat you know because it was it was way up here on the side you know and it's like so so again it's you know I mean I don't know, it's just a lucky shot right so um, and this is uh, you know the event 9-11 uh, um, this was an odd experience in that, well, you know, the event starts and, well, I don't know if this is interesting, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, but it made me very conscious of a very sp kind of specific thing about events like this, and I think maybe perhaps events in general, that when they're underway, your experience is one thing of it. But then when they're finished, they form themselves into a narrative. And in this particular situation, the, the initial, when I started photographing it, I thought it was an you know, office fire. I thought, you know, it's, it's kind of, okay, I'll, I'll make a plate here. I, what I thought to myself was I couldn't get down there fast enough to make an image down there. Uh, because they'd probably put it out, you know. So I started shooting, I shot a couple of half plates, and then I'm listening to the radio, and now the information's coming in about what's actually going on. Um, went up to the roof of my building to shoot, this is a whole plate, so I shot two half plates. Then I went up to the roof of my building to shoot a whole plate. I used a lens which I had never used before, a fast, very fast lens. Didn't have even a lens cap for it. Um, set up the camera. Um, did my best to you know focus it and get everything together um, back to the scene and I had a just a piece of black paper that was big enough to cover the lens as a and then I had to kind of reach and pull the dark slide out and then I pulled it away counted for covered it back up put it there meanwhile I'm seeing there's people up on the roof of my building who are watching this thing here and they're kind of just you know clearly stunned go down to the dark room develop the plate and see it in the negative, and see the, I said, you know, that's a lot of smoke, you know, that's a huge amount of smoke. 
And then, I showed it to people, because you know, it's kind of an extraordinary image. Um, for weeks afterwards, I kept looking, and I don't understand it even to this day, I kept looking trying to convince myself that both towers were still there. I kept looking, I said, no, no, you can, I can see, you know, it's pretty clear what's going on now as time has gone on, but there was something in me that just couldn't, even though I had evidence, you know, it was very strange. At any rate, I don't know how that, you know, how that works out, but I guess it's, you know, that denial thing or something, but it was very, anyway, it's very interesting. This is uh, the last plate wall. The, uh, this is the North Tower. Just before I came out, I had a long lens, and I, I had four quarter plates left, and I um, set the camera up, and um, you could see, you know, I was using a magnifying glass to focus, and you could see through the magnifying glass the intensity of the flames um, on the ground glass. So I made a short exposure because I knew that, you know, in order to get the tumult of the smoke, you had to be a short exposure. But it was a long lens, and, you know, it was an F9 lens at this point here, not a fast lens. So I made this as a test, and I go into the dark room, process the plate, and I come out, I look out the window, tower's gone. So. This was the uh, recent dedication of the uh, site. Um, you have uh, a couple of presidents over there on the right-hand side. Um, so, now, um, in 2007, I went to Paris and I was working, I was trying to make daguerreotypes in Paris. I had made daguerreotypes successfully um, on a commission a sort of partial commission in 2006. I went back there in 2007, and um, the weather was awful. So I spent most of my time in the Louvre and you know, looking around. And one of the things I liked about the Louvre were the uh, history paintings. Now, I had been working with, uh, this, by the way, gets to a point that these aren't daguerreotypes, but they're going to relate to the daguerreotype in the way the daguerreotype operates as a visual medium. So. Um, what I liked about history painting was that it wasn't just an event, it was all of these other people in the event. In particular, this one. This is uh, um, Napoleon crowning uh, Queen uh, Josephine, or Empress Josephine. Um, an odd thing about this one, this is David um, who painted this. An odd thing about it is, the story is that um, Napoleon's mother couldn't make the date. Apparently, she told him that she was busy having coffee with her friends and <laughs> couldn't get him being crowned or crowning himself emperor. Um, but David put her in the shot, in the shot. And that, you see that large woman in the back there, right? Behind, right well, that's uh, uh, Napoleon's mother. And if you actually kind of extrapolate with perspective and the like, she's probably about 50 feet tall. So maybe it's like the attack of a 50 foot woman. Uh, so but at any rate, what, what I loved about this, now I had been doing another series of um, pinhole images where the sun was in the center of the shot and um, it had this whole kind of thing that I, I won't go into. There's all kinds of complicated stuff. So the problem with that series was that the exposures were too long and I realized I needed to shorten the exposure so that I could take advantage of the portraits that would um, appear in the, in the shots that I was working on. So I ended up with this series here. Is, again, it's kind of an historical documentation project but it, it shies away from uh, important moments per se, and is more about the day to day and uh, let's say the lived world that people are in. Um, and contained within these landscapes, and all the sun is in the center of all of them, and contained within these landscapes are these portraits of people. Um, not posing at all, they're just there. Um, so I've made an attempt to, you know, collect a series of these when I travel. Um, 
blow them up rather large. These are uh, shot on 8x10 film. And the similarity for me between this and 19th century media is that there's a constraint, there's a formal constraint. There's only so much you can do with, it's a, I, I built a camera that has um, a very super wide lens on it. And you have to set it on a tripod. You have to have the sun in the middle. It's kind of the rule of the, of the game. And because of that constraint, you end up with images that you, know, you wouldn't otherwise have shot or you would have shot in a different way. And it appeals to me that the image that I get doesn't look like, I don't even look through the ground glass. What I do is I put the sun in the center. I know just about everything in front of the camera is going to be there. And I just shoot. I wait for a moment. You know, I try f to capture something in the moment. But again, it's an idea about history, I think, and history as a lived experience among everybody. See, if you get into the notion of history as a, a media event, then you see history as a narrative, you know, the story told about great men or whatever. And you know, it's an old saw about how that's not really the way it should be told. But for me, it's even more to, the best way to think about history is History is everything that you as an individual remember. So when you have the, a moment where the, the breeze hits you in a certain way or the air smells a certain way or you smell a certain kind of food and you get that flood of a very specific memory, that's history. I think that that's the only valid history that you can put your finger on. And if you think of history in that way, then what you're really saying is, um, <laughs> this was his idea, so. Um, if you think of history that way there, then you realize that history is contained in every individual in the world. That everybody walking around is actually an historian or the container of history. That there is no other history outside of all of those individuals. Like, for example, when I shot you know, the uh, inauguration, I mean, Barack Obama's up there, he's getting, the, uh, he's getting the presidency of the United States delivered to him. And, but, you know, he got up that morning, he brushed his teeth. You know, he put on his shoes and he went there. And that's the real history of the moment. You know, not, you know, whatever the media had you do or, or watching it on TV. Or the history of the moment is you watching it on TV. Or people who are out there in that in that uh, scrum that went back, you know, how many, however many miles. Um, that's the history that each one of those people had that experience. This other thing is, it's not history, it's something else. And so this, you know, this really for me is, uh, you know, what this series is about. And I think in some ways what the whole, you know, body of work is about. But now, there's this other thing which I kind of stumbled on and it doesn't really conform in very specific ways to, to what, what preceded it, but for some reason I feel very committed to it, and so therefore I've tried to rationalize it, which is just the way, to, it's just the way I work. So these are images that I made, which they're glasses, and I, I specifically got the most innocuous kind of water glass possible, nothing fancy, um, and these are all 11 by 14 daguerreotypes. And so my notion about these is, that they're about light, you know, and they're about the modulation of light. And the objects are irrelevant and, and deliberately irrelevant, that ultimately it's an effect that you're, that you're after. Um, and the effect is actually in the space between, okay, here's how, here's how, and they're shown here to great advantage using this. You, show, you shine light onto a daguerreotype, particularly of this size, and it emanates light. I've had people who are very sophisticated about daguerreotypes who've come to my studio and they, they see like three of these daguerreotypes on the wall, and they'll ask me if they're backlit. These are daguerreotype collectors. They know perfectly well what, how a daguerreotype, but they look backlit. What it is is they emanate light. So, in a way, they're related, I think, to like the local stories where the sun is in the center. And it's like if you think of the metaphor, if you expand the metaphor of the personal experience, you know, this is the, I think, 
a generative, an attempt to generate an intensely personal experience using pure light, modulating pure light. And that's kind of what I'm after. I think that there are other kinds of metaphors involved, you know, that, you know, don't bear talking about. But it, I think if I, if I say that much, that perhaps it points in the correct direction, that it leads in, uh, to what it is that I think, you know, I, I can make happen um, in this series, so. It's really like, how does a visual metaphor function? It's really an inquiry into visual metaphor, pure visual metaphor. It's basically glass, a mirror, and the sun reflected through it all, basically. That's it. So uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions if anybody has any. Was it Whipple that took the self portrait? I guess his assistant did. Well, you know, these guys, they had studio assistants, and, you know, I mean, I imagine a guy like Whipple would have had a half a dozen guys working with him. Well, no, actually, it wasn't a selfie. I didn't hold it like that. Actually, I just recently saw on the internet, there's a huge making the rounds of, this comes from, like, turn of the century, these three guys on the rooftop in Manhattan, you know, they got the Toby's and all that, and they're holding this huge box cabinet. One guy's got one and one guy's got the other. They're all like grinning into it. That's the first selfie. It's for real, totally for real. Any other questions? Okay. Like, how much are the, the plates, the silver plates? Oh, well, as they get bigger, they get more expensive. So, you know, like a whole plate, six and a half by eight and a half, which I work with most frequently, uh, until now, with 16 by 20, of course. Um, they cost about, I think they're about $110. So, uh, so you, you know, you want them to work. <laughs> but I will say, you can use a plate about three times before you go through the silver layer into the copper. So if you're unsuccessful, you can repolish it. So, you know, the likelihood of getting an image on a plate is very high. So, you know, I, back in the day when I was shoot, I was shooting five by seven color, you know, when I was younger, it didn't have any damn money. And um, back then it was about five dollars a sheet between buying the film and processing it. And you know I would can think about you know well this is kind of expensive it was expensive. But then I thought to myself you know if the image is any good it's priceless. So what's five dollars you know? And it's like that with any photograph you know it's like if it, if it's good it's not about money you know so it doesn't matter. Oh, uh, what time on Saturday? Well, maybe people, some people won't show up. <laughs> well, what is it? 9.30? 10.30. 10.30. Probably about time for just one more question. Oh, sorry, I didn't jab. Is that it? Okay. Is there any fear when this medium first came out? Because it was so real, it was so intimate. And you, know, you showed the paintings at first, but that was what people thought of as an image. And all of a sudden, here's this really real image. It's very intimate and has a lot of emotion and, and private personality. People, Wary know, of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they were, but I think they kind of went, they, they were wary of it out of the move. For example, which is rather interesting, and I, ha I should go back and actually you know, find this. I, I remember reading in some photo history journal years ago that. Um, one of the immediate uh, fears was uh, surveillance, that people were worried about being surveilled. And in fact, also, one of the great promises that were considered, they says, imagine a medium where you could capture a burglar breaking into a home. <laughs> you know, what great evidence, you know? And this is like 1840s, you know? So, 
Yeah, there was fears, but um, it wasn't like you know the classic, they say American Indians were fear that they were gonna capture their soul and all that. I'm a little doubtful of that even. I think that might have been a, you know, one guy said it and it kind of like swept, <laughs> swept the world. So, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, I've never read of anyone really being fearful, except they were fearful of the, let's say, the, uh, the uh, well, in the old journal there was a quote that said that uh, the, most, the, the greatest danger uh, to a daguerreotypist was the vanity of his sitter. Uh, so everyone was fearful about being portrayed that accurately. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah.